In this video, we will be talking about the second obstacle, which is the capacity constraint. There are considerable variations among the schools in the madrasa sector, not only in terms of sectarian and ideological linkages, but also in terms of size, organization, and access to resources. As mentioned earlier, there's a lot of diversity in the madaris uh, existing in Pakistan. Some madaris uh, have these huge infrastructures. Some madaris, on the other hand, are located in mosques. Uh, some, on, uh, some, in addition to the mosque, are located in, uh, within the households as well. There are a lot of different philosophical orientations of those madaris as well. So what we get to see whenever we talk about madrasa education in general in Pakistan is a lot of diversity, is a lot of variety in the conduct and in the functionality of the madaris in general. And any policy which we like to bring upon or which we like to introduce to the madrasa education that will only be successful if we would consider the variety and the diversity which exists within the madrasa context. Now, this diversity affects the madaris' ability to implement government reform programs because of the very same reason. The larger, well-established schools have already introduced worldly subjects as part of the curriculum. For example, Jami Naimiya has a very good structure of, uh, of integrated a curriculum which includes the Islamic preachings and the teachings and the structures and also the worldly subjects, the worldly disciplines like physics, the chemistry, uh, the, the engineering, the, the pre-medical, a lot of that. So there has been a very good uh, integration which exists. So goes with Minhajul Quran as well. They have their own university now where they offer the Islamic education along with the worldly education as well. They offer masters in variety of disciplines. Now, we need to understand that these schools are part of the policy debate through the sectarian madrasa boards and the ITMD. And I propose really that we need to set these, the two examples I just gave out, as a model somewhere to bring all the other madrasas out there to the same level we need to show these two examples as as the as the front leaders as the forerunners in in coming up with establishing a system where the students not only learn the true islamic principles and true islamic values but also gain the skills equip themselves with the skills which they will be able to use when they graduate from these religious seminaries and in this regard the madrasa boards or wafaqs and the and the and the umbrella body which is itmd has a very clear and distinct role to play the real challenge to madrasa reform may be in reaching out to many smaller madaris which lack the resources and the ability to implement the required changes following reforms but again if the Wafaqs and the ITMD, along with the government of Pakistan, make the deliberate effort. This seems possible and it would have very fruitful results for the Pakistan overall in general. Lacking teachers or the teaching materials and basic facilities, the introduction of regular government curriculum may be beyond the means of these smaller madaras. Now, the third issue or the third obstacle which I like to discuss within the madrasa reforms is the government ambiguity. It is not only madaris that are resisting some of the government reforms. The government itself seems to be split internally on this matter. Now, we need to, before we get into understanding what is this government ambiguity, we need to understand what constitutes the government. The government has a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different politicians which represent the different geographical realities of Pakistan. So the government of Pakistan is basically 
the product is basically the amalgamation of the people representation from four different provinces of Pakistan, which have their own expectations, which have their own geographical realities as well. What happens there is that the in, in most of the cases in the past, the government of Pakistan has a lot of conflict within itself. A lot of different players, a lot of different ministries actually have their own agendas, have their own reasons to, uh, to not develop the clear consensus uh, regarding the policy action on what needs to be done in the Madaris overall. So that split which exists w internally with, uh, within the government of Pakistan leads to a lot of ambiguity, leads to a lot of vagueness uh, in the policy areas within itself and because of that the big issue is the implementation whatever gets to prepared on the paper is so vague is so general and it's so ambiguous that the implementation of it becomes next to impossible Bano in, in her study along with her team argues that the government already has regular contact with most Madaris and through visits by district level officials, the government has an overview of who attends Madaris, how they are financed and what is taught. So what is Bano trying to say here? Bano is trying to say here that although we do not get to see a lot of data available in the reports or on the pieces of paper, but the government ministries, maybe the, the relevant ministries like the Ministry of Interior or the Ministry of Religious Affairs, they have a lot of bureaucratic involvement and communication with the Madaris. So in other words, they know what Madaris are doing. They know how they are financed and they know what sort of teaching is being done there, what sort of curriculum is being followed. But we do not get to see a, a, a proper uh, a sharing of that information at the public level. The government position is also seen as ambiguous by the madrasa leaders who are critical of the government clamping down on moderate schools while madaris known to have links to militant groups are perceived to operate freely. Now see, now that is really hypocritical. How? Simply because when the government sets out and says that there is going to be a clear strict imposition on, on, on functioning properly within the set parameters by all madaris across the pakistan when they say a statement like that then at the same time we see that in action the government is only targeting some of the modest some of the middle level madaris out there and some of the big madaris which actually are known to have certain links with the extremist groups or with the terrorism organizations are do not face any action whatsoever. So now that gives the uh, uh, the ambivalent sort of uh, sort of a message, the ambiguous uh, message, or not so good hypocritical message to the Madaris officials in general. And then there is this lack of trust between the two. So the relationship between the Pakistani state and religious religious institutions is marked with the distrust. So I think. If we want to bring, or I think in general this is true, wherever there are two parties involved, if we want to bring any good relationship or a consensus between those two parties, in our case we are talking about the Pakistani state and the government and the religious authorities uh, for, uh, for the madrasas, if we want them to work together, there has to be the element of trust existing between the two.